friends, wherever you may hail, I'm your host, John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus, where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world. Each episode, we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time, from international relations and global economics to philosophy and science. No topic is off limits. Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world, where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Sean McFate, speaking about a book he recently wrote, The New Rules of War, and also the idea of durable disorder and how it relates to today's international climate. Sean is an author, strategist, and expert on international relations. He is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service, Syracuse University's Maxwell School, and the National Defense University. He is an advisor to Oxford University's Center for Technology and Global Affairs. Sean is one of the world's leading experts on mercenaries. He is a regular consultant to the Pentagon, the CIA, and Hollywood. Sean, thank you for joining us on The Focus. Thank you, John. It's great to be on your show. Sean, for those who are unfamiliar with your work, especially the key points you raise about modern war, can you give our audience a brief snapshot of what you think are war's main drivers today? Sure. Well, it might be easier to explain what it will not be. Um, there's a saying that uh, generals always fight the last war they won. And we see that today. We see this in Ukraine today. When NATO God. countries are, you know, sending tanks and F-16s, and somehow the theory of victory is battlefield victory wins, and it's a very World War II style way of war. The last war, if we're if we're candid, that the at least the United States, where I'm from, won, which is 70 years ago. And I, what we're seeing now, of course, is that warfare has changed dramatically. We live in an information age, like a hyper-information age, and barring nuclear warfare, it will only continue to, to become more so information. And in an information age, information becomes more important than firepower when it comes to victory of war. Meanwhile, we are fighting sort of a Klaus Witzian, conventional war, World War II style war of force on force, uh, around sort of nationalism, when our enemies are using disinformation, especially against democracies and other, you know, plausible deniability. There's all sorts of weapons of modern information warfare that seem to be, you know, AWOL from general officers' toolkits when it comes to winning. Not all general officers, but, you know, a, a lot of them, and also a lot of civilian, you know, policymakers and so forth. So what I, what I, my mission is to sort of rail against this, what I call the Maginot mentality, and try to widen our perspective about what does warfare look like today? How do you win it? And if, you know, especially how does a democracy do this? Because uh, we can talk more about this later, but autocracy is have a lot of advantages when it comes to weaponizing information that democracies simply cannot do. Or if they try to do, they will become autocracies in the process, like censorship. So I'm trying to figure out ways that, you know, how do you win 21st century conflict? And how do we break the mentality, the sort of the, the Ludendorff syndrome, if you will, of just bullets down range is how you win wars, winning battles. I find it really amazing having uh, read your work that, uh, you know, we are in this kind of World War II mentality. And, you know, the thing that I always go back to is that in 2014, when the Russians crap, uh, captured Crimea and they did so in a very spectacular, almost bloodless manner, you kind of thought that that may be the future of war. And of course, what you were saying at the time seemed to have borne this out. But yes. of course, you know, the Russians. They regressed, didn't they? they uh, did. As soon as 2022 yeah. came along, they decided to go down the whole conventional warfare route. Why do you think that was so? This is a remaining question. I mean, Putin, who has been so savvy since 1999 of waging these sort of secret wars globally and turning a basically a hand that wasn't, you know, was crap into like a rising superpower. And then he blows it on one bet, if you will. He goes back to 1941 
blitzkrieg tactics th classically thinks it's all going to be over in three days mm -hmm. and you know defeated by irregular warfare guerrilla warfare by the ukrainians using javelin anti-tank missiles yep. and the war is stalemated but what's even more peculiar john is that somehow the ukrainians regressed along the way so they you know in December of 2022, they got bogged down in eastern Ukraine and Solidar and Bakhmut, where both sides were fighting a neo-Stalingrad or a Verdun. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it seems like we've learned nothing over 100 years, if you ask me. And this is the problem. It's like, why do we forget? You know, um, you know, this is the bigger problem. And I don't know why Putin decided to go full on Blitzkrieg. It's a, it's a huge mystery. And I think also, at least I'll speak for the United States, States is that, you know, the, the Pentagon in Washington, where I live, is learning all the wrong lessons from Ukraine. It is, you know, it is doing selection and confirmation bias where they look at the conventional war aspects like Bakhmut and like the tanks and, the, you know, but they're missing the overall modern aspects, such as the second best army in the field is a mercenary army, the Wagner Group. That's nothing conventional about mercenaries. Uh, how both sides use disinformation to con each other and con the world. How Russia has taken on the strategies and tactics of Al-Qaeda by deliberately targeting civilians to inflict terror. You know, nothing about that is conventional. So in this, you know, if we're honest about it again, this war in Ukraine is not a conventional war. It's not the return to conventional war. And the conventional strategies and tactics that both sides have embraced have only failed. And, and yet they don't seem to be morphing into anything obviously different, which is exactly what you've just said. So it's, a, it's kind of like we're stuck in this almost uh, strategic conundrum of where the yeah. past has revisited the future with better weapons. Right. And the people who are in their respective capitals, the military elites, are looking at this war and drawing all the wrong lessons, which means what exactly? Do you think that, you know, the idea of future hybridized campaigns as we saw the russians conduct in 2014 is now the thing in the past not going to be repeated in the foreseeable future because again you look around the world and you see potentially the economic community of west africa going up against niger niger hosts wagner now uh if that ends up being another conventional force on force battle we're just going to be seeing a kind of repeat, maybe a smaller scale version of conventional war in West Africa. No one's bringing the new kit to the party in the way that we were anticipating. Yes. Well, let's return to Wagner, Wagner Group's business model in Africa and elsewhere, because mm -hmm. I think that they're doing some things which are not conventional. But the larger question of like, why do we fail to learn, whether it's you know, uh, you know, Moscow or Kiev or Washington, you know, the warriors and leaders of countries, they, they have a moral obligation to be competent because when they get it wrong, people die, you know, and we're seeing Russia do that right now. Um, and, the, and, you know, when it comes even to the United States, when it comes to 20 years of Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria, we have a lot of lessons captured, but few lessons learned. So there's a larger question about why do we fail to learn? And what is it about professional warriors, at least in uniform, where they all want to fight some sort of Napoleonic style war, right? Yeah. There's a, an old saying in business that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what that really means is that our strategic culture, and every country has a strategic culture, can eclipse its strategic IQ. And an example of this is like what the United States is doing right now in the Straits of Taiwan. They're, they're practicing you know, a war against China 
uh, like it's the Battle of Midway, but with better technology. Ford-class carriers and F-35s thinking that a battlefield win there can, you know, stop great power competition. You know, when we know for a fact that it can't. And you know why we know that? Because this is how the West won the Cold War. The West won the Cold War and avoided major combat operations in Germany in the Fulda Gap with the Soviets. And they did it through, you know, disinformation, uh, sort of covert operations, coercive diplomacy, better economic policy, and just a better way of life, attraction. And there's no reason to think that China maybe can't achieve that by 2049 too. But we are stuck in a World War II mentality. So is Putin, now so is Kyiv. And the problem is that around the world, people are imitating this while saying, well, if these big powers are fighting this way, that must be that must be the way it is. And of course, you know, Lockheed Martin and the other sort of bandits of the beltway are, you know, sort of pumping this on full force because yeah. to, to them it's its Santa Claus wish list. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think we have to stand back and look at what matters and what wins in warfare. Because if you look at, you know, the West's track record for the last 70 years of war, if this is going to be provocative, but if there's one trend, it's this, is that big armies and high-tech technology does not matter for victory. The French lost against Luddites in Algeria and into China. Uh, the Brits in, in um, Cyprus and Palestine. The Soviets in Afghanistan. The U.S. in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. At some point, we have to realize that warfare has fundamentally shifted since the World War II glory days, you know, band of brothers fought by the greatest generation into something else. But the problem is this, if a guy like Putin, who is very savvy to this, does a 180 and reverts back and seems to learn nothing from that, I don't know what that says about geopolitics of our day. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I don't either. I mean, I've been looking at uh, how the wars uh, developed and it's just... Look, uh, my background is in defense acquisition. One of the th touchstone uh, things that I want to raise with you now is about the metrics of warfare and what the public understands about the metrics of warfare. Now, when you look at all the media reporting that's been going on with regard to the Ukraine war, it's almost as if personnel don't exist and it's all about weapons. We need to get yes. long range weapons. We need to get more drones in. We need to get more artillery shells in. And it's all about quantity and maximizing the quantity of the weaponry you put on the table. <laughs> Now, with regard to the United States, they have invested, and you're absolutely right, you know, they've got their military industrial complex, the Lockheed Martins, the General Dynamics, and so on and so forth. They have invested so much in technology. As you know, it started off uh, during the Cold War, especially the 1980s, you know, where all this new fangled stuff hit the hit the headlines and they were actually scaling up production on a massive level to outcompete the Soviets. We haven't really stepped back from that, at least in the Western model of force structure. Mm. So surely this gives America clear advantages militarily over countries like Russia and China or not. What's your view? It, it doesn't, because I'll tell you why is that, well, first of all, you're correct that the metrics that the US and others are using in places like Ukraine is looking at weapon systems and not people and will to fight. And I also believe that, you know, the most important weapon we possess is a six inches between our ears. Because let's not forget that, you know, the Vietnamese, the Iraqis, the Taliban, I mean, they didn't have superior weapon systems, yet they they succeeded, they won against the United States. And I'm sticking to the United States because I know that better than Australia. Um, you know, and also here's the other question. Does battlefield victory matter anymore? Right? I mean, we all remember mission accomplished. President George W. Bush on an aircraft carrier in 2003 in April, thinking that the U.S. had clearly won uh, the war in Iraq because by conventional world conventional war metrics we had 
it's basically, you know, did you kill or capture more enemy soldiers? Did you take more enemy land? Did you fly your flag over enemy capital? Check, check, check. Yes. That's how Napoleon won. It's how World War One and Two or World War Two was won. But it didn't matter. It, you know, us d- destroying the Iraqi military was inconsequential for the strategic outcome of the Iraq war. So we have the wrong metrics. And if it wasn't superior combat systems that won, then what did win? And what you know our adversaries have done is they've been very clever. They've done things like weaponizing time. They've taken a very Maoist strategy or a Sun Tzuian strategy. And I teach at a war college uh, in the United States, and we don't really study those things. I mean, I try to, but we study Clausewitz, Germany, big war theory, yeah. Um, World War II is the, you know, is, is the paradigm. And we're now paradigm prisoners of this form of warfare. And this is all it is. It's a form of warfare. It's not the timeless and universal form of warfare that we make it out to be. Um, and I don't think that wars can be won. I think, for example, Ukraine could have exploited fissures that are natural between private warfare of the Wagner group and the conventional war of the Siloviki, which is the heads of the Russian you know, military state, the generals, the heads of the GRU, you know, because there's a, you know, we can talk about this, but warfare is always constantly changing. The nature of war never changes, but the character of warfare always changes. And I feel like the West and now Russia has been exposed for being stuck in the past yeah. and that makes them exploitable. And I think a clever adversary can play David to the Goliath of the United States or Russia or, or, or whomever. We need to upgrade our strategic IQ. What does this actually say about the way the West is supporting and advising Kiev at the moment? Because, you know, you're not the, I I would like to think you're not the lone voice talking about this in the United States. There must, there must be some of this message filtering up the chain somewhere in the Biden administration. So if people are starting to think, well, you know what, Russia is a giant with feet of clay, we could trip them up. Why aren't they doing it? Why aren't the Europeans? I mean, the Europeans, they're actually on the European continent. You would think that there'd be some key people in Brussels seeing that there are advantages, asymmetric advantages that the European armed forces collectively could put into the field to help the Ukrainians win. No one's doing it. It's a great question, John. And I I like to think that there are people, um, but they're not, not high enough in rank to to uh, speak truth to power, as they say. Um, I think also some of it is the problem of culture eclipsing strategic IQ, um, Mm -hmm. that US and NATO are like, oh, we don't fight this way. You know, this is not honorable. And for that, I I ask this question, is it somehow um, better to lose honorably than to win dishonorably? And I say never. Uh, And let's not forget that the U.S. and the West and others, probably including Australia, used to fight this way a little bit during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think that there is um, that the U.S. and the West are doing some of this, but it's, you know, of such inconsequence that we can't tell. Right. So we have to turn the volume up or change the way we're doing it or something there is is not as effective as it ought to be. So what I advocate for is a lot more sneakiness. <laughs> we need to be yeah. sneaky. Yeah. Uh, I think war is getting sneaky for a variety of reasons. We need to be sneaky. And I think there's ways we can be sneaky without a tempting a nuclear war. In fact, I think it's a lot better to be sneaky because the Cold War was fought in a sneaky way because, mm. you know, the, the Cold War was fought this way. It's, you know, everybody knew that, you know, the nature of war is to escalate. You know, um, Clausewitz tells us that. Everybody tells us this. And the question is, how do you compete with the Soviet Union without having a Cuban Missile Crisis, without having, you know, it, it go for, you know, have a, a you know, it going from a, a, a platoon shooting at you there to global nuclear warfare in one hour. Hmm. And the way that uh, countries did it during the Cold War is imagine a table above the table we had course of diplomacy, we had, you know, 
threats. We we had strong militaries, but we kept we made very clear that they did not occupy the same grid square to avoid a shooting match that could escalate. But beneath the table, we were kicking each other all the time through political warfare, through clandestine and covert operations, through all sorts of means and ways. And that's what the future is going to be when we have a nuclear China, a nuclear Russia, uh, a nuclear NATO. Um, we're going to have to, but we've forgotten this in the last 30 years. For some reason, the United States has forgotten this. And that this is a question of like, why do we forget? See, here in Australia, we've been uh, putting so much emphasis recently on this new AUKUS compact uh, between ourselves here in Australia, the British and uh, the Americans. Again, it seems to be couched in very conventional warfare terms, you know, as though we're preparing for a rerun of the Battle of Midway using submarines, for instance, you know, but in right. a very conventional way, even though submarines can be unconventional very much so yeah delivery systems right so we're yes, using it sorts. as we used to, you know as we used to do it in world war ii and my problem with that is that from a national security perspective we are now uh starting to reinvent this traditional strategic culture that should be long past us and i think that's that right that the monies aren't going to be well spent as a consequence and nor will the strategic thinking I agree. Um, uh, this is, again, what I call the Maginot mentality. So let's think yeah. about the French, right? So again, the saying that generals always fight the last war they won. Uh, if you go back to 1919, the Treaty of Versailles, the French, um, Clemenceau and the high command of France thought the next world war against the Germans would look just like the one they won, yeah. um, which was, you know, trench warfare. So they built they put all their money into the Maginot line, the one of the greatest fortification systems in history. And if you visit it today, it's still amazing. I mean, it really is amazing. But of course, as we all know, it was already obsolete by 1940. Um, the Germans changed their way of warfare. They changed a lot more in their technology. They, they changed how they used it, how they fought, how they organized, how they resupplied, how they did acquisitions, everything, the culture. And they easily outflanked the Maginot Line. And what, they, what the Germans couldn't achieve in four bloody years of World War I, they achieved in 46 days in World War II. And I fear that this is the, the trend of Western strategic thought. And we see it in acquisitions. We see it everywhere. And then once you have these super expensive, exquisite acquisitions like F-35s and submarines, you have means-driven strategy. Your strategy now is like, well, here's what we have to achieve, but we have to use, these are the only things we have on hand, these submarines. So let's, how do we use a submarine to win a landlocked battle, right? I mean, yeah. that's, you know, this is the problem, the trap that we get into. So again, it's why I say the most important weapon is the six inches between our ears. Sean, you've always been very vocal about the return of mercenary forces to the modern battlefield. Recently on my LinkedIn network, I got into a stoush regarding a post on the use of private military companies. Some within my network believe that PMCs are excellent in being able to take the logistical, technical, and supply burdens off military forces. Their argument being that it relieved those in uniform to focus on fighting rather than support tasks. I questioned whether PMCs were actually a cheaper alternative to in-house supply and support, considering some noted rorting scandals and the costs of hiring PMCs, which is both expensive and has its own complexities, political, legal, financial, not to mention moral and ethical. How do you see the embedded nature of private military companies in Western armed forces today? Is it a help or a hindrance in modern force structure development? What a great question, John. So as you know, I've been uh, I've been banging the drum about mercenaries for at least 15 years. And yep. it seems funny that the world has finally sort of woken up to mercenaries after Wagner marched on Moscow this past <laughs> year. And so people are like, what yeah. mercenaries exist? Um, and, um, you know, and let's not forget the last two to try that were Hitler and Napoleon. So um, and the reason I kind of got I fell into this field is because I was one a long time ago. I was a private military contractor slash mercenary. 
I saw things that shocked me. I wanted to think deeply about it. And I ended up getting out and I did something. I don't, I don't think many of those people do. And I do not recommend it. I went to graduate school, <laughs> which you should, you should never go to when you're trying to sort out your life problems, you know? <laughs> um, the, uh, so I guess the first thing I, I, I think in principle, well, let's leave the whole question of what's the difference between a mercenary and a private military company or a PMC. Let's put that aside. Let's bracket that for a second. I, I personally don't have any problem with companies that do the non-lethal um, things from, for military support, sort of combat service and combat service support, doing admin logistics. Uh, this does not include, obviously, things like trigger pulling. It doesn't include going into, um, you know, doing an, um, a covert operation into a non-permissive environment. It doesn't include training and equipping forces because training and equipping forces is usually done by special forces, and it's a it's a paramilitary slash military function. Mm -hmm. It's not something a, comp a private company does or should do. Only, you know, if a private company does do it, they're all ex-military guys and gals. But I think in terms of logistics and resupply and all that, that's, you know, fixing trucks and cooking food, that's fantastic. Now, do we have good systems in place to mitigate fraud, waste, and abuse? Of course we don't. <laughs> you know, <what> I mean? <laughs> Iraq, Afghanistan, the U.S. experience, I mean, my goodness, I mean, the nation building we could have done at home, I mean... It is ridiculous. Um, and the federal acquisition regulation, which is what governs the U.S., how it does acquisitions, it's, it's like three phone books thick for, that's only, that's a, that's, a, that's a call out to our older listeners, a phone book. But, um, you know, it is, you know, and it's not just corruption within the military sphere. There's corruption within all government spheres of acquisition. Um, you know, also development, you know, the, 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 the aid organizations that countries oh, yeah. have too. I mean, goodness knows where that all disappears to. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, in principle, I have no objection to it. In practice, yes, there are lots of problems and I don't know how to get around that. That You need a, a Harry Potter wand in U.S. Congress to fix that. <laughs> Maybe the aliens will come and solve yeah. this issue for us. <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> Okay, so what about the Russian example of the use of mercenary forces? I mean, we recently saw how the Wagner Group staged a short mutiny against the Russian yeah. military leadership. How did you see this development? And when mercenary groups are coupled to charismatic leadership, do they not pose threats to their customers? Of course they do. This is the oldest problem in private warfare. I mean, look, mercenaries are the second oldest profession for a reason is you cannot regulate them. And the reason you cannot regulate them is contract enforcement. Uh, there, and what we saw, the, the Prigozhin Wagner march in Moscow was not a mutiny. It was not a coup d'etat. It was not a black flag operation. It was a renegotiation. This is classically how mercenaries renegotiate contracts because there's no rule, there's no court you can go to. So... This has led to, for eons, I mean, Machiavelli talks about this in The Prince in 1512, is that mercenaries and their masters rip each other off all the time. Not just mercenaries to masters, but masters to mercenaries. I mean, in the Middle Ages, popes would hire mercenary armies to kill and do unholy things, like the massacre of Beziers in 1209 in France, where it's the famous line where, you know, kill them all, God will know his own. I mean, it's, you know, by the pope's lips, um, or allegedly. And, you know, <laughs> this is, and then they would be deadbeats. Popes wouldn't pay the mercenaries. And this, so this is the problem of loyalty. You know, national armies, you know, sometime magically between 1648, the Peace to Westphalia, and the 1850s in Europe, when mercenaries were fully outlawed in all forms, nation states somehow monopolized the market for force, replaced them with national standing armies that were ideologically loyal to an ideology called nationalism. And um, and they outlawed mercenaries. And that's actually where the stigma of mercenaries comes from today, because 
before then, you know, everybody hired, you, you talk about Mercer in the Old Testament seven times, never with any uh, stigma. Uh, everybody hired mercenaries throughout history. It was just like hiring a contractor to fix your kitchen. It was seen as a bloody and honorable trade. In fact, in the Middle Ages, they were called condottiori, contractors, right. just right. like they're called today. We, the euphemism for mercenary is military contractor. And you work in a private military company today. In the Middle Ages, you work for a free company. It's funny how these euphemisms stuck around. It's not like it's you know it's not like Eubin Barlow and from Executive Outcomes was reading middle middle you know Middle Ages history. It just it's funny how how these things have come out. But um, the the classic problem of of mercenary warfare was many, but the biggest one is contract enforcement, and what happens when one party wants to renegotiate uh, by treachery, and this has always plagued mercenary warfare, and it should be a, a signal to the rest of us because even. If Wiley Putin can control his mercenaries, everybody else should think three times before they hire them. Oh, absolutely. Just as an aside, though, one of my forebears, Leonardo Bruni, uh, who was a great Florentine humanist and chancellor of Florence in the early 1400s, wrote a book, De Militia, in 1420, extolling the virtues of coupling the idea of chivalry to the Greco-Roman ideals of military service. Because, of course, back in those days, the plague of mercenary captains just sure. scouring the Italian peninsula was in, insane. And they were looking for active uh, uh, alternatives to that system. Um, you know, are we in danger, though, Sean, of chasing our tails on this issue with a pendulum swinging in favor of mercenaries in one epoch before being actively resisted in another? Hmm, it's an interesting question. Well, first of all, uh, on your on your quote of Bruni, I mean, it's amazing how Machiavelli gets all the credit for this, yeah. you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, um, but um, yeah, I think that if you look at if you look at history, private warfare has been a, a main facet of warfare for all time. You know, the the Romans relied heavily on private warfare. I mean, they only had 26, 27 legions, and each legion only had about six thousand max legionnaires you don't control a huge empire with this 26 legions they they use proxy they used well also economic warfare and they use a lot of things um uh the middle ages used mercenaries a great deal um most of history is private warfare and the, but the world that we grew up in you know sixth grade or first form or whatever reading about is is that states have been timeless and universal and that's always the way it has been only con you know conventional war, which is the war of Westphalia uh, of states, um, that's always been universal when it has not been. And so what we're seeing around the world is that the pendulum is going back to normal, where mercenaries, where warfare has become commodified once again. And it looks shocking and bewildering to us because it's so alien to us, even though historically it's the norm. It's the only the last 200 years have been the anomaly. Um, and so we're seeing it come back in different places at different times in the world. It's, le it's, it's creating a lot of confusion about its future. Uh, you know, are we going to be heading to an era, uh, to, you know, to a time like 20 years from now where ExxonMobil and Elon Musk get their own militaries? Right. You know, or, or is this Wagner going to dissipate and it'll become a kind of a weird thing of the past? I mean, we can, I, I believe it's going to be more the former than the latter, but it's, you know, anybody's guess, really. Now, one of the one of the key issues about mercenary forces is this notion of plausible deniability. I mean, a state can yeah. direct a mercenary force into an area of conflict and then sit back and say, hey, it's not on my watch. I didn't do anything. So there's no tracing back to a government order. Now, Putin, interestingly, in the aftermath of the Wagner imbroglio, uh, decided to say Wagner is Russia. So he kind of blew the cover of Wagner, didn't he? Well, he blew that cover in July of 2022. When um, let's talk about the Wagner Group. Let's go into some detail about them. The Wagner Group was a weapon of choice for Russia between 2014 and 2022 because of its plausible deniability. Mercenaries are inherently plausibly deniable because they are. You can easily disavow them. And um, and you can hire them to do things. They don't even know who hired them. So, for example, in 2021, Colombian mercenaries assassinated the president of Haiti. 
Now we caught the mercenaries, but even they don't know who hired them, right? Through all the cutouts. So it means somebody got away with assassinating a head of state. And, it's, and success is always going to be replicated somewhere down the line. Other people watch this. And we think it's a drug cartel, but this will just embolden other cartels. Russia has been doing this for a long time now. Well, for several years now. They can send the Wagner Group, like special forces, into a place like Syria or Libya. And if things, and if things go sideways, they can disavow it and say, oh, they're just war tourists. And even though we all know that they work for Russia, you know, are we really going to engage in some sort of international debacle that could lead to a World War III scenario? No, we walk away. To give you a great example of this is February 7, 8 in 2018 in eastern Syria. About three to four hundred Wagner Group guys marched and ran in, ran into almost by accident, um, kind of by accident, American special operations forces in eastern Syria at Kasham. And there was an, an, a battle that lasted four hours between Wagner Group and American special operations forces. The US killed more Russians that night, over 200, than any night during the Cold War. But the reason it didn't go to World War III is because both Moscow and Washington invoked the plausible deniability of mercenaries. Said so nothing to nothing to see here. Hmm. But if those were Russian soldiers, Putin couldn't easily walk away from it. Yeah. So you can see how plausible deniability in an information age, especially plausible deniability, becomes a real weapon of cunningness of craftiness that can be wielded and can be a lot more effective than brute force. I mean, that's how Russia took their Crimea in 2014. They created a ghost occupation of special forces, Spetsnaz, Wagner, you know, Wagner Group mercenaries, little green men, these astroturfed fake militias, um, and lots of propaganda from the, the internet research agency. They created a fog of war when the West was still scratching its head about what were the facts on the ground in Eastern Ukraine, the Crimea was a fait accompli. And only then did Putin come out and say, look, you know, it was us all along, ha, ha, ha. And so that was the initial game plan in some ways for Ukraine in 2022. It wasn't secret, but they used mercenaries because again, nobody cares about dead mercenaries. They do care about dead Russian soldiers. They also don't care about conscripts from the outer periphery of Russia. They care about conscripts from Moscow and St. Petersburg. But when that failed, Putin had to find bodies and he turned to Prigozhin and said, I need you to you know, make Wagner Group, which is like 10,000 mercenaries into like 50. And Prigozhin said, well, for me to do that, I got to go public now, boss. And I've got to empty out jails. And so he did all that. And that's when Prigozhin in July of 2022 said, oh, I actually am, I do own the Wagner Group. We all knew it, but he said it. And that's when they started to empty out, you know, jails to act as cannon fodder in Eastern Ukraine in like Bakhmut, and Solidar. So the, the proverbial cat is out of the bag. Yeah, yeah. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from the US, we're speaking with author and expert in international relations and mercenary forces, Dr. Sean McFate. Sean, as we wrap up this podcast, unfortunately, I've got like a, a litany of questions that will run into another two hours. But I think we need to sort out a time in the future where we can actually address some of these things because it's a fascinating conversation. But in your idea of durable disorder, what happens to the utility of nuclear deterrence? For instance, if Pakistan, an established nuclear power, fails and its nuclear capabilities cannot be secured by U.S. or Indian forces and ends up in the hands of Taliban or ISIS-like groups, durable disorder might have a bit of an end-of-times ring to it. I mean, such <laughs> groups are apocalyptic and mm -hmm. would not be deterred by nuclear weapons of the Security Council 5. So considering their acts of violence are often perpetrated against civilian targets, if they had access to WMDs, they would probably use them, right? Well, um, it's a great question. I mean, so you have examples of the Ali Khan network in Pakistan uh, about 20 yeah. years ago, um, sort of <clears throat> selling 
Pakistan's nuclear secrets to high bidders like North Korea and others. Mm. Um, and certainly nobody wants to see the loss of nuclear weapons. I do know that uh, the control measures around nukes, at least in a country like the United States, they have like a remote control on off switch. So if the if the nuclear warheads or whatever somehow gets stolen, the U.S. presses a switch and in theory, they, it, it renders the nuclear weapon inert. I suppose somebody could, you know, take it apart and rebuild, use the parts for another nuclear weapon. I don't think that's easy. I'm not a nuclear scientist. Now, does Russia and Pakistan have that? I don't know. Um, and certainly for tactical nukes, these are nukes you can shoot out of artillery. I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a bigger threat because you can take ta tactical nukes, put them into a truck, drive them into, into someplace, a, a city, and explode them, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's enough yield to, you know, make it count, shall we say. Um, but I do think, you know, as I... My interest in what I call durable disorder came from my work as a private military contractor in Africa, because many people look at sub-Saharan Africa, which is where the conflict markets are, which is, which is why I was there. It's why Wagner is there. You know, there, it's, it's sort of like the Middle Ages. There actually is governance on the ground. It's local. It's highly imperfect. It's very futile. Um, human rights violations occur all the time, uh, just like they're occurring all the time in Ukraine today. Um, but there is governance. So just because there's not a strong nation state presence doesn't mean that there's no governance. And if you look at them like a map of Africa or much of the world, the Middle East, parts of South Asia, the geographic lines that denote states really don't reflect where the boundaries of power begin and end in those regions. There, it's quite a mosaic of things. And our job is to understand what that mosaic truly looks like on the ground. And how, how can we, how do we frankly push and pull that mosaic for our own interests? Um, and that durable, so it's sort of like the Middle Ages. We think of the Middle Ages in Europe as like the Dark Ages, as you know, the Knights of Knee, and you know, mm -hmm. it's it's crazy, it's it's dark, but in truth, it wasn't. The, the, it's not like the sky was falling. Invest in more sky for lack of a strong nation state system. There were a lot of global governance, but it was messy. You had fractured sovereignty and overlapping sovereignties. Mm -hmm. That is what we're seeing in much of the world today. But again, we have this very state-centric Westphalian conventional war model of formal institutions using formal ways of modalities of war to fight. When war, we're in a post, you know, Westphalian era, we're in a post um, state-centric era, we're in a post everything era, and we need to get smart. And it doesn't mean that everybody is. I mean, Australia is not, the US is not, you know, West Europe is not, but most of the world kind of is. I mean, Latin America is with narco states and stuff. We need to recalibrate how we embrace the world and how we are frankly going to exercise power and restraint to achieve our national interests and not go back to some 1940s glory year model. All right. Final question for this episode with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's all about China. And here in Australia, we have been very concerned about the the might of China. We are America's unsinkable aircraft carrier in the South Pacific. You know, to the north of us, we have Japan. And then a little bit to the west of Japan, we have South Korea. The three of our states are extraordinarily concerned with what's happening in terms of Chinese military maneuvers in the South China Sea, and especially with regard to military exercises close to the island of Taiwan. Now, you know, if one's a betting person and one were to see all the sort of bravado that Xi has, uh, the Chinese leader Xi has put forward in terms of capturing Taiwan, it does speak to a, a notion of conventional war. So how do you think this plays out? Because up until now, the Chinese have played this salami slicing, very clever, tactically positioning, non-lethal influence operations, especially here in Australia, you know, using uh, both uh, corrupt politicians as their entrance point, or perhaps uh, by, by uh, using the Confucian centers at universities. You know, they have got a lot of influence over us. 
And yet, you know, here we are planning World War II redux. What are your thoughts on that? This reminds me of how Moscow and Kiev fell into a conventional war with each other, even though they didn't have to do it. And they're, they're both bleeding each other dry. Uh, they've both, you know, frankly, Putin's badass talk has come down quite a few notches. Mm -hmm. And um, they're both in trouble, let's face it. Um, yeah. And I think that um, China and the uh, our quad uh, is has the same challenges. Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, I was in Hawaii at Pacific, U.S. Pacific Command, which is the military command that run is in charge of this military for the U.S. sort of controls and commands this area, mm -hmm. and they are strictly in the World War II paradigm. You know, their focus is, is putting Chinese steel at the bottom of the, of the South China Sea only, you know, not only, but mostly. Uh, and it dominates their strategic thinking. And this is a huge problem. And the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, are the same. Mm -hmm. And um, this gets back to this question of like, why do professional militaries all want to fight this Napoleonic warfare? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And even that... China doesn't even have a, a tradition of this. I mean, they won their war against the nationalists using Maoist guerrilla warfare and yep. protracted war. So it's it's a bizarre amnesia for which they have no excuse. Um, now that said, um, their military, I mean, their foreign affairs office is clever. They are doing things, you know, we focus on that. Well, the US focuses on the military as an act of mirror imaging because the military for us is the lion's share of our budget. Um, we spend more on our military than Saudi Arabia's GDP. I mean, it's it's really crazy. Um, and so we're invested in this way of war mentally. And I think, um, but China really isn't. Um, they're doing things like economic warfare through Belt Road Initiative uh, in Africa and across Asia. They're doing um, the three warfare strategy, which you talked about, the war of influence. They use lawfare. They can be quite clever. They're having a lot of problems right now with their economy and some other issues that uh, we can talk about. But, you know, doing, you know, they honestly, they can, in my opinion, they cannot even, they cannot occupy Taiwan until early as 2027. They don't have the amphibious ships needed to even do it. So why are we all treating it like they're going to do it next year? Um do they even need to do it at all? They have until, you know, um, you know, 2049 to absorb it culturally and economically. I think they can probably do that if they really want to. Um, and, and, you know, I think if we really want to weaken China, I have some interesting ideas for another episode using what I call sneaky war to do that. Uh, the idea is not to, not to, you know, take over Beijing and fly our flag there. The idea is simply to make them retreat a little bit and stop threatening their neighbors. And we can do it by being more David than Goliath. Mm -hmm. And it's going to raise some interesting questions about how, what are we prepared to do? But I think those are questions that need to be surfaced, that people should think about. And are they somehow less risky than nuclear war over the streets of Taiwan? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Well, Sean, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there for now, but I've got you on a promise, Sneaky War, the next episode that we're going to do. Yes. Thank you for joining us today and for sharing your insights on The Focus, Sean. Thank you, John. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into The Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find The Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the media drop-down menu and hitting podcasts. And please leave us your comments on inquiries at sageinternational.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart, and to the team at the Ozcast Network. Join us again next time as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus.